My name is uh, Ben Kemp. I'm the Operations Manager here at Grant Cottage State Historic Site and I'm pleased to be presenting today uh, a presentation on Ulysses S. Grant and Thomas Nass. The friendship uh, of these two individuals uh, uh, is a very interesting subject and we appreciate the support that we receive from our members, donors, and um, from Alpen House uh, to sponsor these programs this year. Uh, to be able to put these programs on, and we appreciate your support and your interest. So, this presentation is not intended to detail the complete lives or careers of Ulysses S. Grant and uh, Thomas Nast. However, uh, we will learn a bit about their lives and a little bit about their careers. Obviously, if you were to dive into either one, you'd be you'd be here all day. Uh, so, I instead want to show how two individuals born about 20 years apart, Grant being the elder, um, they rose to fame at around the same time. And their fates were intertwined. In a way that uh, poet Walt Whitman uh, could only explain in, in regard to Grant as the gods, the destinies seemed to have concentrated upon him. Well, obviously we know that it wasn't just dumb luck or circumstance or chance, uh, but convi conviction, character, and talent that brought uh, these men to prominence simultaneously. In different but divergent ways, these two men dramatically influenced the direction of American politics and society at a pivotal moment in history. Um, I think that these two men uh, developed a friendship uh, on top of their a personal friendship, on top of their professional uh, friendship, uh, speaks to both of their characters uh, as well. And they're going to use their talents to dramatically influence American history. So I'm going to look at some of the similarities uh, in the effect of their endeavors, one with the power of rank and office, and the other with the power of pencil and paper. So both their lives uh, in boyhood, uh, one growing up in the city, New York City to be exact, and one growing up in southern Ohio in the countryside, uh, but both actually had a taste for adventure. Young Grant uh, took incredibly grave risks riding, um, doing stunts on, a, on horseback as a child, very, very dangerous stunts, whereas Thomas Nast, as a very young boy, would chase after fire engines to fires in the city. And of course, just living in the area that he did in New York City, which was an area with much crime and, and, uh, and danger, uh, was something that, uh, that always, basically both individuals dealt with danger, but actually were attracted to it in their earlier days. And Grant, of course, is going to take his love of horses from this period, um, and those were some of the times he almost died in his life were from horseback riding accidents, and similarly, uh, many of the threats that uh, Thomas Nast encountered during his life were actually related to uh, getting himself into circumstances uh, essentially as a, as a cartoon journalist. Uh, getting himself into dangerous circumstances um, that um, put him and his family at risk. Uh, he brought his sketchbook. I mean, Thomas Nass is going to bring his sketchbook as a boy to sketch these fires that he saw and, and other exciting events in his neighborhood. Just, just He always had that, that, that desire. And Nass would later say that genius and ideality and inspiration are gifts that, uh, and they can't be created. So there's, there's something about the uh, natural talents and abilities in both Grant and Nass that are going to play into their careers as well. They both uh, displayed in their childhood uh, quite a bit of independence. Uh, Grant is going to be a running uh, livery service for his father at 10 years of age, you know, of course, related to the horses again, uh, whereas Nast is going to get himself a job in the city as a 15-year-old. He's going to be, they almost laughed him out 
uh, of Frank Leslie's illustrated offices uh, because he was so young, but they sent him on a mission to go do a sketch, uh, and he brought the sketch back, and they were quite impressed. Uh, he had had some training before that, but again, uh, it's important to note that this was quite an opportunity for Nass because he had been born in Germany, came over to the United States with his family at a very young age, and so this was not something that uh, was available to everyone. Um, so he must have had some natural talent to be able to impress uh, the folks that Frank Leslie's illustrated. And Nass is going to engage in the risky business of depic depicting corruption in the city, um, and that's really where he's going to find his, you know, his initial in the 1850s. There, um, he's going to find his initial uh, power. Uh, the power that's in illustration. Um, he's going to bring uh, his father, essentially, uh, Joseph Nast, is, is going to leave the old country, uh, Germany, during uh, the tumultuous years around 1848 and bring his family over here. Um, there was revolutions and political upheaval in Europe at that time. And they're going to bring some pretty liberal viewpoints with them. And so that's going to play into Nast's later career as well. And that started, uh, that basically came from his, um, his upbringing, but also in his experiences within uh, the political, pl politically tumultuous area of, of Manhattan of the 1840s and 50s, because many of these uh, immigrant communities brought with them uh, their political views, uh, and many of them fled Europe because of their political views in that, in that period. So this is also ultimately it's going to lead to Nash um, supporting the uh, Republican uh, the Republican Party and Grant eventually. Uh, Nash is also going to uh, develop a, a very early on an aversion to slavery uh, and oppression as well, something that Grant had a, a sensitivity to as well. So Nash is going to become very politically well versed in the uh, in this environment in New York, even as a child, being exposed to it and growing up. Of course, he was working as a child, basically, as a 15-year-old. Even before the Civil War broke out, both Ulysses S. Grant and Thomas Nass were um, exposed to, to war. They were not strangers to war. Grant had experienced uh, the tragedy and terror of war in the Mexican-American conflict in the 1840s, and a 19-year-old Nast is going to be a war correspondent in uh, covering the campaign of Giuseppe Garibaldi in Italy in 1860. So they're going to encounter the cruelty and injustices of war. He's, on the right-hand side, uh, there's an image of uh, Ulysses S. Grant, uh, and a uh, artillery battery, and on the left is also an artillery battery during the Italian uh, Unification War uh, that Nast was sketching, and it's a terrifying uh, scene, um, which is actually depicting uh, Neapolitan soldiers um, that are, and they're actually, I guess you could say, executing um, wounded Garibaldi soldiers um, through burning them. So certainly the, the, the horrors of war were not uh, unknown to these two men. So they had experience, and certainly Nast at this period is not, uh, this is not a cartoonish career that he's got yet. Uh, this is more, um, you know, uh, journalistic in nature. Uh, he's just recording the scenes as they played out in a very natural sense. Grant is going to find his heroes or people he respects in the Mexican War. That's going to be Zachary Taylor and Winfield Scott. Um, and Nast is also going to um, look at Garibaldi and what he did for Italy. Uh, and in his sketches, uh, definitely um, portrays him as a great leader uh, and does a lot to enhance uh, the Italian liberators. Um, reputation and his and his legacy. And Garibaldi would, you know, a lot of the you know traits that Nass saw in Garibaldi, he would later, you know, see in Grant. So Grant himself actually um, 
admired Garibaldi, received a dagger in, in the Civil War that belonged to Garibaldi, and, um, and he even said on his world tour later in his life when he was in Italy, there's one Italian whose hand I wish especially to shake, and that man is General Garibaldi. The reason I bring this up is because, again, Grant not so openly, but Nast uh, definitely um, saw individuals as heroes, and Garibaldi was a hero, early hero for Nast, and then Grant would later on uh, fill that role as well. But Grant certainly saw some men uh, in that way. And again, this is going over some of the similarities between these two men. Uh, distance makes the heart grow fonder. Both individuals um, had fiancés that they had to essentially leave for, for war. And Grant, when he's serving in Mexico, he's going to pine for his fiancée, Julia, who's left behind in St. Louis, and they're going to be separated for some time. Nast had very similar concerns as Grant did. Grant was hoping that Julia wouldn't run off on him uh, with another man. I mean, you could certainly imagine being, you know, a thousand miles away from your, your fiancé and uh, maybe she's got some other suitors that are chasing after her. Well, Nast had the same concerns for uh, Sarah Edwards, uh, who was known as Sally to him. And so his, him and Sally's relationship, uh, very, very young at the time, of course, just as uh, Grant and Julia were when they were first courting. Um, so he's going to leave Sally behind to, to document the war in Italy uh, in 1860. They both wrote many letters, and some of them still exist, uh, to their fiancés, and they always had romantic gestures, and uh, there was heavy evidence of homesickness uh, within, their, uh, within their letters. They were both devoted to their families, and they were both happiest in the home circle. They both had to prove themselves and make enough money to provide the lives that the parents of their fiancés expected of them, too. And so that's going to drive both Grant to succeed and also Nast as well to, to seek uh, more, more to be able to pro provide for their families. Nast is going to marry his sweetheart in the first year of the Civil War, September of 1861. Of course, Grant and Julia had already been married for some time prior to the Civil War. Uh, and both wives, uh, Sally and Julia, would both, both uh, support their husbands in, in various ways. Uh, Sally would actually help uh, write because, of course, um, Nast, uh, you know, uh, English was a second language for him, being born in Germany and growing up for, a few, for his early, early childhood there. And uh, so the, it was difficult for him, and, and writing was a bit difficult for him. Uh, and so Sally would help with some of that correspondence and writing uh, and give him different, uh, different advice on some of his work uh, later in his life. Uh, but, of course, the emotional support was, was really uh, pivotal for both men. Uh, they, were, they were very connected to their families. So they wanted to provide stable lives for their, for their families. Um, both were fearful of separation. They were always happiest at home. Uh, that was something both men probably saw in each other when they eventually started having a personal relationship, which we'll talk about in, a little bit later. And Nast's work is going to actually reflect this, uh, this, this uh, you know, uh, the importance, the vital importance that he saw in the family unit. Uh, as it was seen in, in the 18, middle of the 19th century, I should say. So that's going to play into a lot of his themes, uh, and it's, it's, going to be, it's going to play a pivotal part in, in, in connecting with his audience. And that's what we're going to find out as we go through. We're going to find out there's a lot of sincerity in what Thomas Nast is doing, that he's not just you know, filling the pages for his employer, that he actually has convictions about these things. Uh, that he's doing, and capturing the hearts and minds of the people is going to be crucial, especially during the pivotal and volatile and tumultuous and sad and uh, terrifying uh, ordeal of the Civil War.
And in order to really understand how NAST is going to have this meteor, meteoric rise, just as Grant does, I mean, people understand that Grant had his rise because they needed good soldiers. Uh, you know, Grant uh, was a good soldier, and he was identified, and he rose in rank. But for NAST, um, he had to stand out from the crowd, too. And for him, we again, to realize what was going on, we have to realize how important print media was, especially during war. Um, it was king. It was everything. There's no television. There's no, you know, there's no social media at the time. So newsstands and newsboys were on every corner, uh, and citizens desirous of, um, you know, being informed and connected to the greater political and social world had to, you know, had, you know, they they grabbed periodicals, uh, and it was really the glue that stuck society together, and and that's how f people formed political opinion. So NAST is going to come into this environment where. The print media is everything. It's all you have. You could almost say that uh, Thomas Nast was the social media influencer of his day. You know, he's 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 a person that uh, that has this opportunity uh, within the framework that's already there. But you have to shine a little brighter than everybody else around you, and you have to have something unique that you can offer your audience, or at least make a a good connection. And that's what we're going to talk about: is how Nast makes his connection with his audience. He arrives back to the United States from his time in Italy, right, right as secession is breaking out and, and there's rumors of war. And, and at the same time, Grant is in his father's leather goods store in Galena getting ready to, to join the army and do his duty. Neither at the time were household names. Uh, these were not famous men when they entered the, the Civil War. But their, their experience and drive to succeed is going to result in both men experiencing uh, that meteoric rise to fame and financial gain. Now, one of the things I find interesting is both these men, and maybe they saw this in each other, had really good powers of observation. You know, Grant, it was a military style. You know, he, he had men come into his headquarters and tell him all sorts of various information, and he could soak it all in and then make good decisions based on it. He didn't get flustered easily. He didn't get, uh, he, he kept himself focused. Uh, and for Nast, to be able to accurately depict or depict things, he had to not only uh, depict what he was seeing uh, with with great accuracy, uh, because a lot of illustrations at that time just all they didn't necessarily the illustrator didn't try to be too they didn't try to put too many details. It was mostly about the general subject they were they were showing, you know, like a, a battlefront or something like that. Whereas in Nast's drawings, you start to see this incredible detail with faces and emotions and things like this, where he's noticing this and recording it. And this is really what's going to draw people into his, his images, is this ab ability for him to observe and remember uh, these and sketch these things. Um, and this is really going to come, uh, come out in, the, in, in his illustrations of the Civil War. Uh, he noticed details everywhere, um, and he's going to put them in his illustrations. And that's really going to give him an edge on, uh, against other illustrators that were more just trying to churn out just basic journalistic illustrations with no, not too much emotion in them. Um, he did begin with basic illustrations for New York Illustrated News, uh, just basic journalistic illustrations, but he moved on to doing more emotionally and politically charged work for Harper's Weekly before the end of the war. Um, and he would work for Harper's Weekly for about a quarter of a century. So powerfully compelling Images like the one seen here, which is Christmas Eve, uh, 1863, um, is is what Nast excelled at, and he's this type of emotional imagery was more effective than just drawing, you know, a literal scene from the war, and and that's what Nast is gonna that's gonna move him ahead of everyone else uh, for as far as um, illustrating the war. It's going to set him apart. Nast began um, one of the one of the examples. And here, I'll, I'll just show you. He used themes. Uh, you have the circular uh, themes where you have two circles come together. Obviously, you got to put things in the corners because that's the format that you had, you were printing as back then. It was a square format or rectangular, I should say. Uh, so he had to put. And he, he would often put you know various themes together. And sometimes it was opposing themes, uh, north and south. In this case, it's home front and the war front, and, and it's very powerful. The way it's very evocative, very powerful, and very easy and quick to understand. You don't have to read anything to understand what's going on. And that was the, you know, we'll talk about that 
in NASP's work a little bit later how important that was to those that had issues uh, with reading. Uh, and, and how important it was to have the imagery speak the story. And that's, that's what NAST is going to do. And so you see some bucolic scenes and, and different things that he's putting in there. Uh, and, it's, and this is really capturing that moment. So not only did he have to be observant of what was going on in the war front, he had to understand what was going on in the home front as well and how those two things interconnected. So an example of NAS moving away from just these basic scenes of, of war to more political themes is something like emancipation. This is going to yeah. uh, be put out uh, shortly after the Emancipation Proclamation. And this is a, a vision of what NAST believed emancipation could look like for the African American. And in, 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 in he saw, and in, in he's going to, this is revolutionary at the time, he's going to put uh, African American family in the center of this yeah. is 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 depicted like a, a white family, yeah. uh, and and that was very revolutionary to do something like that to say, oh look look, these individuals who have not been able to uh, you know live this way or, or you know this this is their future to be able to live this way um, and have opportunities and so Grant always had a you know again he 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 had um, a sensitivity to the oppression of African Americans and certainly wanted them to have opportunities and of course we know that's going to align with Ulysses S. Grant's views uh, as he goes into his presidency as well. Uh, so you can see the uh, where they're coming from you know he's always kind of contrast you have this uh, you know idyllic what's going to happen what's possible is in the center but out on the outskirts you've got uh, illustrated where they where they came from so you have that the, by showing that dichotomy then you realize just how far uh, this could bring them, just how many opportunities they could have um, as opposed to, uh, again, you know, uh, terrible whippings and all this abuse and oppression. Uh, so th this was, again, during the war, middle of the war, this is uh, even, bef you know, this Emancipation Proclamation obviously resonated with uh, things that he already believed, that Nast already believed. And again, the idea that, that comes up, and it is uh, brought up, it is, is this Nast's opinion? Is this Nast himself, or is this the paper that he works for? Is this employer telling him what to do? And th there's a lot of evidence, uh, different biographers mention that there's a lot of evidence uh, out there, and they truly believe, uh, his first biographer, Alfred uh, Payne, uh, actually got to talk to him. So, he, you know, he, and, and actually developed it from in-person interviews, uh, the first biography in 1904. Uh, but the idea is that he was convinced that Nast, this was his personal convictions. And so, you know, again, he was not just following the party line uh, politically, and he was not just following his employer's uh, requests. In order to reach the hearts and minds, you know, he's going to use these skills that not all illustrators have. It's going to start to bring him, you know, get him out f away from the pack of all the illustrators that were working in the Civil War. He's going to appeal to deep emotions in his illustrations. Um, by engaging his audience, he can start introducing to them political themes. In an, in, a, in an effective way. And so his key to success as a political illustrator uh, was to be sensitive, to be observant, uh, and he's going to tap into the collective public emotions. Um, but it's also to be genuine, to be genuine and passionate in the conviction of his works. As I was saying, you know, I believe uh, that that's, that comes through in his work. And in this way, Nast developed a personal bond with his readers. One of the a turning point for Thomas Nast uh, in the Civil War and in his career was the draft riots in New York City in uh, July of 1863, just after the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, there is a conscri conscription in the North, and the uh, predominantly the Irish uh, immigrant community in New York is very upset that wealthy people can buy their way out of the war; they can hire a substitute, whereas the you know, the, in, the uh, impoverished have to serve. Uh, so it didn't, uh, there was a, a serious fairness issue going on. And, uh, and so this, uh, but there was also, uh, unfortunately, in the midst of this, there was something that bothered Nast even more, which was uh, the violence, a lot of the violence of that, of, of that terrible event actually centered on African Americans within the city. And so the, the Irish uh, actually, uh, you know, took out a lot of aggression, 
there was many, many deaths, murders, lynchings, um, because there was, a, you know, a social, um, there was, I, the Irish at the time believed there was a social threat from the African American, uh, in, in that they, you know, they were being told by the papers, the papers inflamed all this, uh, the newspapers, and they convinced the, the Irish population in New York that the, they would go off to war, they would die, and the African Americans would take their jobs. And then they would have nothing when they came back, if they survived. So that's what they were convincing them of. That's what the press was convincing. So this uh, obviously whipped them into a frenzy and ended. And, 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 and Nast was out there. He was in the streets trying to record this, and he had to go back to his house. Uh, because Nast, having a decent amount of money at this time, um, and, um, you know, yes, being an immigrant, but not necessarily, um, but having that money and that, you know, enough money to hire a substitute, kind of put him, you know, possibly in danger and his, and his family in danger. So he went home to his family. He, he sketched a bit, but he, he saw a couple of people die right in front of him, and, and it was a terrifying event for him. It changed him. It changed him, and and sadly, uh, it also it is it is the impetus for his uh, works that are uh, anti uh, Irish, uh, anti Catholic, um, and 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 those those themes as well as his empathy for the African American, the plight of the African American, are going to really be fired by this. So it really is a turning point in his career. Um, it, it, things are going to turn very political after this, uh, to, to say the least. He's gonna he's gonna really go in this direction. Um, And obviously the way to do that is, uh, the, the people that most fit with this, uh, his ideals at this time was the Republican Party, and that's going to be Lincoln. And if Lincoln gets elected, re-elected in 1864, that's going to, that's going to be, um, that's where Nast is going to end up uh, agreeing that that's going to be the best for the nation. So, and obviously Grant is going to do, uh, Grant also is going to be all in uh, for Lincoln as well for the same reasons. So Nast is really going to, uh, you know, evolve greatly as an illustrator during the war. He, he took uh, the traditional portrayals, as we saw, of American life, and he, and he incorporated um, the style into more evocative scenes, more emotional scenes, uh, introducing, you know, of war and, and politics. It reached a wa watershed moment uh, in, in uh, 1860, uh, 1864. In the summer of 1864, he releases Compromise with the South, which is, uh, again, he uses this really, um, this really effective method. And what he does is he uses this effective method of showing people what will happen, what could happen, what will happen. So instead of saying, oh, there, you know, this is just bad, He's explaining, he's illustrating, oh, this is where we're headed if there's compromise with the South. He shows the veteran, the wounded veteran, and in memory uh, of the useless war, you know, all these people dying in vain. All these people dying in vain. And this was a very powerful emotion because many of these men had already gone home by this middle of the war. There was many injured veterans. There was many families that dealt with death and injured veterans. And what if it was for nothing? And so that's what he's putting out to people. But more importantly, this was in the summer of 1864, and Lincoln, President Lincoln, was supposed to be reelected, or was, they were trying to get him reelected that fall. So having this come out at a pivotal moment where Lincoln's reelection was not certain, uh, this was an incredibly powerful uh, image itself to the American public, but it also was very important to Nash's career because of how wholeheartedly uh, the Republican. Um, establishment would actually uh, adopt this uh, this picture, and it was actually run multiple times uh, in, in Harper's. The illustra uh, Harper's Weekly at that time was you know had uh, throughout the war had a subscription over a hundred thousand, and that was just a subscription. Obviously, people could buy this as newsstands, newsboys, and so it had a massive for this time. It had it had a massive. It was a massive powerhouse of political uh, political commentary, and Nast is going to be you know, front and center for that. So Grant and Nast uh, both shared a passionate loyalty to the Union. Uh, President Lincoln um, is said to have recognized Nast's, uh, the, the effect of Nast's illustration on the war effort. He stated, uh, Nast has been our best recruiting sergeant. His emblematic cartoons have never failed to arouse enthusiasm and patriotism and have always seemed to come just when these articles were getting scarce. 
So certainly, uh, Lincoln's bringing another aspect into it. It's not just the political, uh, you know, him helping him politically, uh, but we're also seeing how um, Nast is also helping to keep the morale up uh, to bring more people into the war effort. And of course, uh, Ulysses S. Grant needed all all the help he could get at recruiting to fill, keep the ranks full, especially in, in 1864 at the end of the war. We see a very early depiction that Nast did, and he worked for a couple different magazines on the side, including Funny Fellows, uh, spelled with P-H, Funny Fellows, and, um, and uh, he's, it shows um, Grant being brought in from the West, he was you know, Western general, then he's brought to East, and now he's dealing and cleaning house. It's Mrs. <laughs> was Mrs. Grant from the West, Lincoln's new servant girl. Uh, so it's uh, and Nast is getting a little bit more into the uh, cartoonish uh, aspects here, uh, but they're they're a little pensive. You can see uh, in the image, uh, Lincoln and, and and his cabinet members are are a little pensive about him. They're not sure, uh, you know. They've given Grant this responsibility, and they hope for the best. It's it's a hopefulness, and Nast is showing his own hopefulness in this new uh, hero of the West that he can come east and finish the war. It says, uh, the caption says, uh, Grant, it has Grant saying, I'll have to clean this place out first, Mr. Lincoln, before I can commence to work properly. So, obviously, some of the individuals already in, in the rank of, you know, the, the officers in charge, you know, Grant may have to clean house a little bit uh, or adjust some things. Uh, and he did. He did make some adjustments when he came. So, convergence. Nast and Grant are going to come together. This is where their careers, you know, it's not like Nast did not uh, depict Grant as in the war, but they're, 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 their careers did not fully converge, <laughs> you know, or as much as they would uh, after the war. Nast, a after the war, did some uh, painting, he did caricature work, he did book illustrations, uh, but none of it's going to be as lucrative or, or gain him as much notoriety as his cartooning, his political cartooning. And so that's really going to be the direction he goes based solely on that, that it was the most effective medium, the most effective style that for him, and he went into it wholeheartedly. He was he was not disappointed in it. He he believed he was an artist, and he believed this was the way he could reach the people. Uh, the Johnson administration gave him plenty of fodder <laughs> for material. You know, the the Johnson was uh, everybody had high hopes when he took over, and they were hoping the best. Uh, but that soon quickly turned south. Uh, no pun intended. And, uh, and, and Johnson is going to be ridiculed harshly, whereas he's going to lift Grant up, even during the years before he was president, in between Lincoln's assassination and Grant's first term. And so these are some of the illustrations that come out. Uh, Grant kind of being held back from, from doing what he needs to in the South, uh, Prometheus bound uh, on the uh, cliff. So, and, and you're going to see this a lot in work. He, you know, and it, it kind of adds an air of uh, sophistication because he's using classical literary uh, themes and things like that, and Sally, his wife, would read these things to him in the evenings, different plays, you know, Shakespeare and, and all this, and he would use some of this content uh, to really create more evocative images, uh, like Grant uh, on the cliff there, uh, nude, um, you know, being picked at by demons, essentially. Um, furies, they call them. And so very evocative imagery. Uh, you can see Grant kind of kind of uh, dealing with the, the, the big <laughs> you know, dragging around the big the big wigs of, and uh, moving forward and getting things done there in Washington. Uh, they're both going to have a severe dis, you know, um, dissatisfaction with the Johnson administration and they really feared where the country was headed. You know, this was a big issue. Um, NAST valuing in integrity um, is going to be drawn to Grant because Grant, he believes, is a man of integrity. He's going to go so far as to see Grant as a hero. And he's not going to hide that. He's not going to hide that. That's another thing about Grant's work, uh, Nass work, is that he's not going to hide his bias. He doesn't have to. You know, the idea that is he a, is he a balanced uh, editorial journal, journalist, he's, he's, he's a, he's a um, it's, it's an opinion-based uh, work. And, and, and that's certainly not, that's something that was fully acceptable uh, within the constraints of his employment. Although he did receive some pushback, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. They both, uh, as I mentioned earlier, they both desired to see protections and advancement for the African Americans. Um, and they, they wanted to see Reconstruction be, uh, after the war, the 
process of reconstruction uh, allow for that. And so they didn't like anybody that was getting in the way of that. Nast is really going to uh, hit his stride with the Republican Party because he's actually going to go to the Republican National Convention. Grant didn't go, but he, he was nominated. We'll talk about that in a second. But Nast goes to the Republican Convention in 1868, and obviously he's going to be supporting Grant. So he creates this mural on fabric, he painted a mural on fabric. Um, and it's got uh, Grant on a pedestal, uh, on a column, and then it's got an empty column. And essentially, it was challenging the Democratic Party to, to match him. <laughs> yeah, and that's going to be the idea. Can you match this guy? And 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 he's going to wait, and it's going to be a dramatic moment. He waits till Grant is nominated officially, and then he's going to drop the cloth in front of the banner, and it's this dramatic moment, and the crowd roars, and the whole convention hall is 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 roaring, and everybody knows that it's Nass that made these, and so he's going to really. This is going to solidify his place. Um, as a you know, symbolic you know, uh, cartoonist within the uh, uh, Rep Republican Party. He's going to take this and go straight through the campaign season. He's going to be the most powerful advocate, probably on paper, most people would say, for Grant's election. Um, and he's going to obviously use that same themes that he used before of showing how bad democratic rule would be. Uh, and, and, and showing, uh, using side-by-side -side photos and comparisons of, of you know, how, uh, how, what you would get with Republican rule and what you're going to get with Democratic rule. And it was very effective the way he did that. Um, uh, one of the most powerful of those illustrations came in uh, 1868 during the campaign, and it's called This is a White Man's Government. And uh, he's got... Uh, uh, I think it's Nathan Bedford Forrest, a uh, very well-known Confederate veteran that later was part of the Klan, the, the KKK. Uh, you've got the Irish uh, from New York depicted, uh, and politicians as well. And they're obviously they're you know stepping on an African American, keeping him from getting up, and it's it's the idea of white supremacy, uh, pretty clearly laid out here. Uh, and it's dark, and you can see buildings burning in the background. This this really. Um, you know, apocalyptic scenario if you end up voting Democratic. Um, you're going to get uh, basically what, again, that theme continues, what, what did they fight for if you're just going to hand the power back to those that just so recently um, rebelled against the United States. Um, so these characters, you know, he believed they shouldn't be in power. Um, even on, on Nathan Bedford for, for, uh, uh, Nathan's um, Forrest's dagger says the lost cause right on it. And that's very early use of that. Obviously the Irish club says a vote. We, they, you know, we'll talk about how uh, that corrupt, you know, he hated corrupt voting, uh, corruption in voting. It was a sacred thing to Thomas Nass, the vote. And then uh, you've got, uh, again, that same theme that he used in the RNC convention. Uh, you have Grant uh, and then you have Seymour, who was his main opponent, opponent um, for for the election, and you you have a pretty clear yeah you have a pretty clear difference. And obviously, there's things that are a little harder to see in the photo, but you know, burning in the background. And this is a you know hero uh, in Grant, and then and then in the other uh, side, you see uh, burning, burning and despondency and darkness, and uh, you know the uh, the a, 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 a dead child. I mean, it's terrible things in, in that. So uh, he know, knew how to grab people's attention. Um, Nast is going to celebrate the election of Grant. He attended the inaugural ceremonies uh, and, and received praise from all, all directions from the Republican Party for his contributions. He, emboldened by the environment, he's going to uh, draw an illustration. Um, while he's in Washington for the inauguration, he draws an illustration and sends it into Grant's office. He doesn't go in, but he sends it into Grant's office. And what it is is his his cabinet members as a bag of cats coming out, and and they have no heads. And he gave it to Grant and said, "Can you fill the heads in? Can you fill the names in of your cabinet members?" He was trying to get the scoop, you know, on what you know. And Grant, you know, politely, uh, you know, made a joke and said, "No, I can't do that right now." Uh, you know, <laughs> realistically, Grant didn't have it, the decisions made yet. Uh, but that was one of the early interchanges. It was a very friendly one uh, between Grant and Nast. One of the things that Grant and uh, Nast absolutely 
uh, thrived in was independence. You know, the idea that uh, Grant wanted the freedom to make his own military decisions, uh, he wanted freedom to make his own way in the world even before the war. Uh, so there was this streak of independence, and they didn't like being under someone's thumb, uh, and, uh, and Nast is specifically going to jealously guard this freedom that he has, the freedom of expression uh, throughout his career. Um, and he's actually going to, it's going to be challenged numerous times. He, he had to deal with, a, specifically, the political editor of Harper's Weekly was George William C Curtis, and he's going to come to loggerheads with the guy for, you know, probably the better part of two decades at Harper's Weekly, and it's going to be this, he's more, C Curtis is a moderate, politically, oh. you know, and doesn't believe, you know, and Nast, of course, is very extreme in his views and grows even more extreme uh, in, his, in his cartooning, uh, more, more, um, uh, some people would would label it as, as labeled it as vicious, but he had to deal with criti much criticism as well. Um, both men did severe criticism. Obviously, Grant during his presidency, he had to deal with severe criticism, but also Nast too. Um, but they used their work and the results of the work to vindicate their purpose. Not they that's the way they could push beside the criticism. It's not that it didn't, that didn't bother them. The criticism did bother them, but they said the results are still worth it. They're definitely worth it. So that's the way they retain their mor morale. And for Nast, it actually fired him up more when he was criticized or he was challenged. Um, um, also, Nast is going to be uh, involved in another violent event, sim almost similar, probably flashbacks to the draft riots of 1863 and 1871. There's something called the Orange Riots, uh, which again is, is, is based on uh, the, the Catholic and, and Protestant Irish uh, that, that there was a uh, basically a, a, a riots in the streets, there was a parade, there was riots and actually Nast was there with the National Guard. He was actually there as a National Guardsman out so he's seeing people dying in the streets again. Uh, this political violence, this terrible political violence, he's going to witness this again. Um, this is going to deepen his political viewpoints. It's going to entrench him even more where he is. Uh, Anti-Catholic, anti-Irish, uh, but also sympathy for the African American. Um, in to add to all this pressure, he's already got. He's taking on a major corrupt political machine in New York, uh, which is called Tammany Hall and run by someone called William M. Boss Tweed. And so this is going to put his life in danger and that of his family, because he's still living in the city at this point. It was right around this time that he thought, maybe I should get my family out of the city. This is getting a little hot. Um, they tried to threaten him. They tried to bribe him. Uh, so, you know, bribe. He said he had bribes in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. That's, that's a fortune just to get him out of the... They told him, go to Europe. Get out of here. Stop coming after us. Uh, anything to get him out of their hair. Um, but this was a righteous cause to him. This was justice. And so he continued his crusade, and the pressure and the danger seemed to actually fire him up more. Um, he, eventually, his, he was eventually successful in, having, uh, in, in influencing the elections against Tammany Hall, against Tweed. Tweed actually would eventually uh, die in prison. But, and so, at least tempor temporarily, he, 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 um, he diminished the corruption within the uh, government of, of New York City. And, but this, this, was, this became national news, this, this, this uh, crusade he had, and would actually elevate his career too. But during this dangerous time, he's going to make that decision, and he's going he's to move his family out to Morristown, New Jersey, a nice home out there. Uh, his family was growing. It eventually would be five children uh, and his wife, Sally. So Grant uh, is, is uh, he's going to need a couple things going into the second term. Uh, he's going to need some defense because there's he's getting some attacks that he didn't have in 1868. So going into the 1872 election, uh, he's going to need some more help. And this is where the two men are going to really start to develop more than just a professional kind of uh, distant relationship of sorts. This is where it's going to become personal. So Nast is going to come into Washington in early 1872, uh, and and he's actually right after he arrives, he's going to. Uh, be able to finally meet in person the man you know he admired so much, uh, President Grant. Grant actually heard that he was in town and actually you know uh, wanted to see him, uh, so he knew a little bit about Nast and uh, already. And um, 
he would write back to Sally uh, back in, in, in New Jersey about uh, his experiences with the president. And he was quite surprised. He said, I had a very pleasant chat with him, uh, the president, about everything in general, and I was very much pleased with his honest way in which he spoke to me. No lockjaw. I was there about an hour and with him, and he asked me to dine with him and his family. I went to dine with Grant and his family at 5 p.m. and did not get away from the White House till nearly 10 in the evening. Had a very pleasant time, and they did seem very homely indeed. No nonsense, no show, but the real thing. And I think what tw uh, what what Nast really saw in Grant at that point was something you know, kind of like kind of who he was, <laughs> a man who just loved the home circle, and there was no he was not pretentious. Uh, it was just this very loving family environment and very down-to-earth people, uh, and I think that really drew him in immediately. Uh, Nast was not only privileged to meet the president, uh, but he would actually get some access to uh, some very powerful circles uh, in Congress and powerful people on his visit there. Uh, many uh, of these individuals actually opened up to him and gave him some very important material uh, for his work. Um, so he, they, he had some valuable information he was getting, and he's just getting un believable access uh, to these people and their and personal dinners uh, with senators um, and it's interesting um, he had a he even had one dinner with with uh, Secretary of State Hamilton Fish I mean with a cabinet member he, and uh, he, they, they they talk so much uh, that later on Nass joked that uh, that other people called it a nasty fish dinner uh, <laughs> because they were conspiring so much at the table him and in the Secretary of State. So it, was, I, and it became obvious before he left Washington that this was becoming more than just a professional relationship with President Grant. Uh, it was turning into a personal relationship. Uh, more than meetings and dinners followed. That was the thing. He, he kept going back to the White House. Like He kept getting called back. He was going back days on end. Uh, and this was surprising him, too. Uh, that that um, Horace Porter told him at one point this was one of Grant's, uh, you know, staff members during the war, but also served in his administration. He, he said to Nast, I have never seen even governors, I've never seen people, you know, Grant, you know, take a liking to somebody and bring somebody in so enthusiastically as you. So obviously Grant saw something in him um, as well. He, he realized the influence he had. Uh, and, he, and he wrote jokingly to Sally, he said, I see the president nearly every day and it, he was always very much pleased to see me. It's funny how all the senators are in a flutter about my being here and are all afraid that I will do them up. <laughs> Darling, the power I have is terrible. I, it frightens people. But darling, you will have keep a good lookout for me and will not let me use this power in a bad cause. So, you know, again, he was starting to realize that maybe some of these individuals were courting him so they didn't, he didn't make any dirty pictures about him, you know, that, that uh, dragged him through the mud a little bit. But uh, So he, he was obviously realizing how much influence he had in political, political national political matters. Grant's going to open up to him. He's going to personally open up to him and talk, talk to Nast about some of the personal challenges of being president. Uh, and he says uh, that there's machinations going on to prevent him from being reelected, uh, which was true. Um, and because he wouldn't, wasn't easily directed by other powers, you know, other Congress people and stuff like that, that they get, this is quoted as Grant saying, they get mad and kick me more than they ever did any president before, he said to Nass. So he was opening up and, and giving some personal uh, feedback. And again, anybody who knows Grant's style, he, he really only opened up to you if you he really brought you in as a friend, a confidant. Into this embattled environment uh, where Grant was dealing with a lot of criticism, Nass is uh, ready to stand by Grant and he's going to set to work defending Grant of all these accusations of corruption and he's going to work hard to secure Grant's re-election. Uh, he's going to attack the, the, the hardest political opponents that Grant had, Carl Schurz and Charles Sumner. Uh, and he's going to use some of the same tactics he used in fighting the corruption in New York City as well. But it he would save the, the most brutal attacks, the most brutal attacks for Horace Greeley, Grant's main opponent. He's going to receive the brunt of Nass' relentless cartoon attacks. His... Grant's, uh, I should say, Nast's work was really uniquely bold, uncompromising, and tactful. And he get, again, if you asked his critics, they would say he was, uh, he, it, they were vicious. They were vicious. Uh, but it's all in how you per perceive it, all in how you look at it. Grant was very pleased with his friend's work. He stated, stated to a common associate that you are not only a genius, speaking of Nast, 
but one of the greatest wits of the country. So we saw that the, the satire, the seriousness, it's all mixed in together, and we're going to talk about that. Although he was happy with the content NAS was creating, this is interesting too, Grant actually realizes how feverishly his friend is working, must be working. He literally pulled out one of Nast's uh, illustrations and he shows it to this common associate that both him and Nast know. And he says, look, it's another illustration. This guy must be up all night writing, you know, doing illustrations. Uh, and he actually showed uh, concern that the artist would break down. He used the term break down from all this incessant work. And Nast, sadly, would uh, have physical effects of his work, his, his uh hands and his arms uh, would, would have uh, trouble, maybe, maybe something we call carpal tunnel today, uh, but he had some serious issues with uh, the amount of work he was putting in, uh, did break down his body uh, throughout, it, throughout his life. Um, during the campaign, Nast himself is going to weather a storm of criticism that his materials were too harsh, uh, but the more extreme the opposition, the more he dug in, uh, so he didn't back down. And one of the papers said uh, during the election cycle, Nass very boldness, his terrible aggressiveness, is what challenges admiration and makes Harper's Weekly a success. So, some of the illustrations from this time period. This is right after he, he spends time on the left, Vanity Fair, 1872. This is something, uh, an illustration you can really see. Uh, uh, just It's a caricature, but it's a very, very flattering one. He's showing Grant as this, this very calm, collected, uh, you know, um, um, affable uh, individual, you know, uh, and very stable. And this is, uh, you know, something that, that he experienced himself. So he didn't, they don't believe he drew this from life, but it would have been very fresh in his memory from those visits to Grant in Washington. Uh, so again, shows a little bit of that friendship. Out of the Ruins, 1873, again, he's defending Grant and his ability to kind of, you know, bring the country back out of some financial crisis. Uh, make some good financial decisions as, as he's uh, grant to the policeman is pulling Columbia out of the wreck of Wall Street basically. Wall Street obviously as we'll find out later did come back to bite them both. Um, uh, the uh, elephant uh, is, becomes a major symbol of the Republican Party. The donkey of, uh, uh, for the Democratic Party as a symbol did exist previously but uh, Nass is definitely going to take these two symbols and, and really make them uh, household, uh, I, I, obviously they're perpetuated to this day, you see the symbols being actually used uh, by the parties today. But this is more, uh, the two things that he's going to, Grant is going to be in his third term, uh, this is 1875, the third term trap, uh, in 1875, there's two major themes. Grant is abusing his power, Caesarism they called it, or Grantism, and the second thing that, that he's going to tackle uh, is the third term, which was seen as inappropriate for a president to go for a third term. And so he's going to tackle these two things, these two themes, and fight back against it. So the, the high water mark of, of, of uh, and these are a couple of uh, later illustrations showing that he continued after the election, he continued uh, to illustrate Grant on his world tour and when he arrived back in 1879. So the high watermark can be argued that Nass' career was, was the election of 1872. It was an absolute pinnacle. It proved the force of his political might. Um, and he, got, again, uh, gained the trust and friendship of many people of influence and power. Nass did not rest on his laurels. Um, and he was dedicated to his craft. Just as he had denied thousands of dollars from, from the Tammany Hall to, to silence him uh, as a bribe, he, he, he was asked by a reporter, would you take a place in the Grand Administration? He said, oh no, that would kill me. I wouldn't minister to England, be a minister to England. General Grant nor his friends have never offered me anything, and I, I'm glad they haven't. I know Grant to be an honest man, and he knows that I am actuated by unselfish motives. They may all have the power, money, and position. I must be satisfied with the glory a cottage paid for and my wife and babies. Why, Tammany Ring offered me $250,000 if I go to Europe when I first began to expose them. They came to my lawyer and laid all the plans for its pay payment, but I said, no, I cannot swerve from the right line. But the campaign had been very trying on Nast, and so he did take a sabbatical to England. 
with his uh, with his family after going to Grant's second inauguration. So he wanted to celebrate. Um, when he arrived back in the U.S., he did his first lecture tour, and this was terrifying for the man because he shared one fear with General Grant, and that was getting up in front of a large group of people to speak. He did not like public speaking. This was very difficult for him. He could powerfully convey his, his, his feelings and images, but when he got him up on stage, he had stage fright. And this is going to be very difficult. But he was also in a position uh, at that time in his life where he needed the money as well. Even though he had gained as much notoriety as he did, he still needed money. So, like Grant, he, he could, he'd be very open and funny, and, and, and he was a great humor, you know, he was, he was a you know, very humorous man, a uh, very friendly man, very open, but that was in, in private, just like General Grant could be very open and good storyteller in private. But once he goes on the speaking tour, it's going to be very lucrative. And he's going to draw pictures during it. Part of it was, you know, he did some lecturing, but he also drew pictures on the spot. So people got to see how he did his work. He explained his work. And it was very popular. The audiences loved it. Uh, but he never got used to it. It never felt comfortable to him. So it was always a terrible ordeal. He's writing back to Sally that these are torturous events. You know, getting on stage, he's sweating like a pig on the on the stage. And so it never went. It was never easy for him. It never became easy. But he had to stick with it to make sure his family was provided for. And he's dealing with the homesickness too. Grant is going to run into some of the similar things on his world tour. He's bound by respect to have to give speeches in these different countries he, he, he visited when he went on his world tour. So Grant, also a man who didn't like public speaking, was forced into it as well. In this uh, image we have um, uh, Grant on his world tour. When he arrived back, uh, again, he didn't, Nass did not forget him. We saw the illustrations where Nass was still illustrating his friend when he was out on his world travels for two and a half years. Well, when Ulysses and Julia were in Japan, uh, they made sure to buy some nice, really, really nice vases and sent them back to the to the nests. Um, so they didn't didn't forget their friends, um, and and they would actually visit uh, the Nast family in in Morristown uh, before uh, before they left on their world tour. Uh, so they had a, a, a wonderful dinner there in 1877. And Nass was trying to make this visit perfect. This is before Grant left on his world tour. He's trying to make this visit perfect. Everything, the meals got to be perfect and everything. But he, was, he started sweating at the end of the meal. He had forgotten the most important thing. Nast wasn't a smoker. Oh my goodness, I have no, I have no cigars for my friend General Grant. Well, General Grant noticed, apparently, that he was anxious and, and divined, basically, what was wrong with him. And he said, it's all right, Nast. I remembered that you don't smoke. He said, besides, I never go into action without ammunition. <laughs> And Nass would have been, or Grant would have been really interested in that. Nass took his home in Morristown, New Jersey, and he liked eclectic things. Him and Grant liked different cultures and, and experiencing them, but he liked collecting things. And so he had all these exotic and eccentric things within his home, and it helped inspire him in, in his art. Uh, and Grant would have liked that. Grant's parlor after, after his world tour was full of that stuff, too, uh, in his world travels. Uh, but that was all over the NAS. It basically would have been like a Ripley's Believe It or Not museum inside of <laughs> NAS home, the way it sounded. And that's an image of, of NAS and, and his wife uh, Sally in 1872, and that's their home, or 1877, and that's their home in uh, Morristown, which is still there. It still exists. I, I don't believe it's open to the public, though. It is on the national, it is a national historic landmark, though. And, and this is the vase, actually. It, it meant so much to uh, Nass that he actually put it in a depiction in 1886, one of the vases that was, came from Japan, from the Grant family. Um, wow. Mrs. Nass would all, or, or the Grants would also give the Nass family a prized portrait of, of General Grant as well. Uh, and they put that, you know, that obviously that was one of their prized possessions. So, seriousness and satire, and this is really what it comes down to. What is going to set... Uh, Nast apart. What is what is his what is this what is this thing that that makes him the great cartoonist of the of the nineteenth century? Uh, it's going to be the interplay of satire and seriousness because you grab people with satire, you engage your audience with satire, but then you interject a serious subject in there. You're actually talking about something serious, and that's not easy to do to have that good balance. Um, one contemporary paper 
uh, describe the object of political cartoons not simply as humor, but to tell a serious truth humorously. Uh, Nast's ability to combine satire and seriousness was really crucial in, in engaging the audience. He incorporated also, obviously, cl classical literature, mythology, things that we, people were familiar. Familiar themes helped, too. Uh, so, so, you know, a little bit of sophistication uh, as well. And the ability to laugh at oneself. You know, Grant and, and, and Nash were both uh, uh, good at self-deprecating, making jokes about themselves. Nash would, you know, make himself this short pot belly guy and his, in his, uh, he'd, he'd caricature himself. He was okay with that. You know, he was okay with seeing all that. And, and they didn't care about, you know, disheveled hair or clothes or anything like that. That wasn't as much of a concern to them as their, as their physical image as some, uh, some of the uh, dandies of the time, maybe, if you could call it that. They both had a great sense of humor, and again, you saw it come out more in the private circles, you know, in private. Um, and it's going to help them get through the difficult times. Making jokes uh, is going to help them through the criticisms, things like that. As far as humorous, they had a combined friend, a mutual friend. Anybody, anybody guess who that was? Speaking of humorous, huh? Mark Twain. Yes, Mark Twain. Samuel Clemens is going to be a friend of both of them. Um, and, and there's going to be professional interaction between Nast and Twain. They tried to do more um, collaborative efforts. It just didn't, a lot of it didn't pan out, but they definitely were professional colleagues, but also personal friends, too. And, you know, Twain actually would go to Nast's house uh, and, and dine with, 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 the, uh, with the illustrator. So they definitely were personal friends. Twain is just going to be absolutely enamored with, with Nast's work. He says just after the 1872 election, he says, Nast, you, and this is a letter directly from Mark Twain to Thomas Nast, you, more than any other man, have won a prodig prodigious victory for Grant. I mean, rather, for civilization, civilization and progress. Those pictures were simply marvels. And if any man in the land has a right to hold his head up and be honestly proud of his share in this year's vast events, that man is unquestionably yourself. We all do sincerely honor you and are proud of you. Yours ever, Mark Twain. So certainly, you know, to have the praise of Mark Twain. You know, it's one thing to get the praise of politicians, things, but to have the praise of a humorist, a fellow, a fellow, uh, um, you know, satirist, uh, it must have been, meant a lot to, to, to Nass. It was those things that helped buoy the, the, him amidst all the criticism. But I think if anyone under, you know, understood that delicate balance between satire and seriousness, it was definitely Mark Twain. Sadly, Grant and, and Nass's lives at the end, would, their fates would be quite inter intertwined, especially in the mid-1880s. Um, after not visiting uh, for a number of years, um, the Grants are able to visit Morristown again. In fact, Frederick Grant, Grant's oldest son, moved his family to Morristown. They had a home there. So they were visiting Fred, but they also spent uh, an evening dinner at the Nast home. And Nast said, what would, wanted to make sure he had this wonderful dinner, and, and he said, what, what would you like, General? And he said, I've been going around the world eating all sorts of fancy little birds and everything like that. Just give me corned beef and cabbage. And that's, so that's what they cooked up, the Nast family. And it was a good, good old uh, home-cooked meal, and they just had a wonderful evening together. Um, so, and the Grants had a home about 60 miles southeast, but, but they had, you know, professionally, things had come up, and they couldn't really spend a lot of time together in those uh, those years after he came back from his world tour. And uh, they would dine again before they left town over at Fred's house, Fred, uh, Grant's son's house uh, as well. So, um, But this is going to be a monumental moment because in the midst of all this, Nast is going to become a, an investor in the same firm that Grant and his son are heavily invested in, his sons, I should say, and called Grant and Ward, a Wall Street investment firm. And he's going to put the considerable sum, basically all his savings, $30,000, Nass is going to put it into Grant and Ward. He's going to enjoy dividends, just like Grant had for a couple of years already with this firm. He's going to enjoy dividends. Uh, and he's going to put some of the dividends back into the firm. So this is, going to, this is taking quite a risk, but again, at the time, this was seen as a good investment. It even prompts him to take a break from Harper's Weekly, you know, his main source of income, uh, and he traveled to England and with a letters of introduction from Grant, who, who let him, you know, introduced him to all his good associates and, and acquaintances in, in, in England. And so um, he takes a bit of a sabbatical there with all this newfound wealth. Um, 
but in the spring of 1884, Grant and Ward, the firm, collapsed. And it's going to bring down the hopes and the financial stability of both men. Um, but once the shock wore off, uh, that's when both men are going to show their true metal. They're going to get, they're going to forge ahead and make sure their families are taken care of. Uh, Grant began his short-lived literary career, while Nast went back to the dreaded lecture circuit. Uh, Nast was was absolutely devastated, and this is a, a picture, I should say, of Grant. Uh, and a self-portrait of Nass showing a very dark time in his life, obviously, um, and Grant the same thing, his suffering right here at the cottage in 1884 and 5, and, um, and, and an image in the center, uh, Nass is depicting the, the Wall Street collapse, um, the ticker tape is, is taking people down. Nass was devastated by his friend's death, uh, General Grant here at Grant Cottage. Um, he made a uh, full two-page spread, the hero of her age, dead. Uh, this was his memorial to Grant. Um, and it's all very, very serious. There's nothing, there's no satire here. This is all very, very serious. Um, and it shows how much uh, he cared for his friend. Um, and even a decade later, he would still be working, you know, working to perpetuate the legacy of his friend in 1895. Uh, he's going to go to Galena, Illinois, and deliver this amazing painting, which still resides in in Galena, in the in the um, in the museum there, uh, and and it depicts uh, peace and union is the title, and it depicts uh, the surrender, and it just has such a uh, an incredibly emotional. Uh, it's an emotional scene. It's the end of the war. It's Grant's compassion. Uh, it's all it's all fired in here. So, echoes of these men's careers linger with us today in the form of government institutions like the uh, National Weather Service and uh, Department of Justice, things we take for granted, you know, and, and when it comes to uh, Thomas Nast, people, people think of him because they think of the modern Santa Claus. He, he popularized the modern Santa Claus and, and uh, Uncle Sam and, and imagery and the Republican elephant, the Democratic donkey. These are things, but, but they're, obviously they're, they're, their effect on our society was not just in these illustrations and some of these institutions. They dramatically changed the course of the nation with, what, with, their, with the effect of their, of their work. And as often is the case with, with great men, people focus on their achievements and the results of their work instead of the story of the men, men themselves. And I think hidden in their personal lives, in their relationship, uh, is the true drive and inspiration that led to those accomplishments. And I think that's why it's important to look at the personal lives of these men so that you, want, you can better understand where they developed their opinions, what they saw in each other, and how that affected not only their friendship, but an entire nation. So there was something beyond just professional pursuits that drew these men together. That may have been the initial reason they met or, or saw each other, but they definitely saw something further. And I think what they saw is, is two men that were, you know, saw in each other was men that were absolutely dedicated to pursuing justice and to they were devoted to their nation and to their families and I think they saw that in each other and they, that mirrored each other and, and that's what attracted them uh, to each other and upon Nass death in Harper's Weekly they described their artist that was with them for a quarter of a century as a patriot who lived and worked and died a true lover of his country and a stalwart warrior on her behalf. There is some good resources out there. Unfortunately, I don't think Nast uh, receives as much recognition as he should, just as some of us believe that Grant, even though he's a popular household name, doesn't necessarily uh, get, get a deep enough look. Uh, so there are some further resources that I would recommend. Uh, one is the very first biography by Al Albert uh, Bigelow Payne, 
uh, done, and, and that was from interviews at the time, and that was published in 1904. It's called Thomas Nast, His Picture, His Period, and His Pictures. And uh, it doesn't have footnotes, but not many books did back then, but it's a lot of good information. It seems to be very reputable. Uh, then you have uh, the more recent biography uh, that I, I definitely recommend, very well written by Fiona Dean Salerin, uh, Thomas Nast, The Father of Modern Political Cartoons, uh, a very good biography. Uh, I think it's just under 300 pages, so it's very manageable. This, this is a monster of a book here, but, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, and, and then uh, as far as collections, in Morristown there is the uh, uh, McCulloch Hall Historical Museum, and they have uh, a considerable um, archive of Nast's uh, letters and, and works uh, because they're based out of um, Morristown, New Jersey, uh, where he lived. Um, Nast, sadly, um, you know, his life would end in 1902. He con con continually had trouble after that trying to provide for his family. He, he did everything he could. He continued to do everything he could for his family. Uh, but sadly, he died uh, and did, couldn't leave much for his, his wife, Sally. He died in 1902 um, uh, from a, uh, I believe, uh, a yellow fever epidemic. He, was, he had been appointed uh, as, as, uh, as an official, uh, government official to Ecuador. And he died in Ecuador, sadly. Uh, separated from his family, but doing just what Grant did, which was going where he had to go and doing what he had to do uh, to take care of his family. So he pushed through pain in his hands and his arms, did whatever he had to do uh, to make money for his family, put himself on stage when it terrified him. Uh, and I think that's you know something similar between the two men, is they were willing to do anything for their country, willing to do anything for their families. Uh, so I think uh, that's why they, they got along well together. But as, on a personal note, I think Nast's uh, illustrations are absolutely fantastic. Uh, you know, you could certainly say they're a little harsh at times, but uh, but that's his style, and and that made him unique. Uh, but his the illustrations are just so well done. I think he was just a wonderful illustrator. Uh, I have a personal attraction to his work. Uh, you know, so that drew me to him. And then when I found out there was a connection with General Grant, well, that just helped too. Um, <laughs>